Well, welcome back. If this next session was anywhere near as exciting as the first session, then it'll be a good day. So we're going to pivot now to focus on robotics. Let me introduce a new panelist here. That's uh, Dr. Moritz von Bolmos. He's a new faculty member here, and he heads up our cardiac surgery robotic program. And we're going to be joined online by Dr. Min Kim, who is the chief of thoracic surgery here, and about 90% of his practice is robotics. So I want to introduce you to a new concept of something that we've been building here, and that is the idea of it's called MIRIN, the Methodist Institute for Robotics, Imaging, Navigation. Stuart, you want to say a little bit about this concept? Yes, so you know, Houston Methodist has a massive inventory of robotic systems in all medical specialities. So cardiovascular, orthopedics, neuro, etc. Um, and these are obviously designated by the FDA for a specific use but we are continuously pushing the boundary on what we can do with these devices. So we are currently getting a, a huge database uh, together of all the procedures that are currently done on our current robotics um, platforms. We are developing content with those robotics, but more importantly, we are identifying new procedures and new bottlenecks which we can try and solve. And if we do not have the robot, we'll build the robot to get what we like. And I think we're going to give you a little taste of what Mirren is. We have a, a video which the team have put together. So let's have a wee look at Mirren. Okay, so there you go, so to be continued. Um, you may be familiar with the Da Vinci system, it's by far the most kind of commonplace robotic systems out there, and they're made by Intuitive Surgical. Um, there are other players in that market, um, such as we have Johnson Johnson, which are coming out with systems, we have Siemens, um, we also have uh, Carl Storrs, etc. Um, but by far the lead marketplace at the moment is uh, Intuitive Surgical and that's why we kind of focused a little bit more on the DaVinci systems at the moment. And to that end, I'm really delighted um, that we have the Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of Intuitive Surgical, Dr. Jamie Wong, has given us a video. Hello everyone. I'd like to thank the Pumps and Pipes organization, in particular Dr. Alan Lumsden and Dr. Stuart Core the invitation and for including me in discussions surrounding the development of the Houston Methodist Institute for Robotics, Imaging, and Navigation. As a da Vinci robotic urologist, it's exciting to think about how far we've come as a robotic surgery community and where we can go from here. Thanks in a large part of the innovative work from people from different disciplines with different perspectives, all coming together to solve a common problem, similar to the origin of pumps and pipes. Before I get into how we at Intuitive are working with our customers to deploy these technologies in their hospitals and health systems, I think it's important to first take a step back and look at why we're deploying them. What problem are we as an industry trying to solve? We know the complication rates remain high and readmission rates are driving up costs, not to mention the impact on the patient experience. So the big question is, how can we make surgery better? Is there an optimal way to perform surgery to get the best outcomes? And if there is, how can we teach it and make it scalable to enable the mastery of surgery? 
One way to look at it is in terms of technical, clinical, and operational mastery. Technical mastery, how do I use robotics, imaging, computing, and analytics to get better as a surgeon? Clinical mastery, how do you design a system that enables the right clinical outcomes? And beyond that, as you look across an OR or a hospital or a health system, how do you perfect workflows and achieve the right economics in a way that enables a provider to standardize on certain things that they know work? All of this with the goal to advance the quadruple aim, improve outcomes, patient experience, care team experience, and total cost to treat per disease episode. Advancing care is not just about technology. It's not just innovation for innovation's sake. It's fundamentally about people. It's about solving a specific problem for a specific person. And when technology is involved, you need to have an understanding of the person using it, what it's being used for, and the environment in which it's being used. It's this deep understanding of human processes within the hospital that's critical to delivering clinical and economic value. It's not a technology only effort. For 25 years, we've worked closely with surgeons, care teams, and hospital leaders to develop systems and capabilities that are helping to address the real challenges that they face. Patient variability is significant, so you need to be able to address a broad range of patients from the fifth to the 95th percentile. Every surgeon, care team, and operating environment is also different, but that doesn't mean that they should be impacted by subjectivity. We employ inclusive design principles designed for diverse patient, surgeon, and care team populations, as well as diverse operating environments. Every team should be the best that they can be, because that translates into the total cost of care, the outcomes that affect hospital economics and patient satisfaction. We're committed to working with our customers to improve the holistic episode of intervention. So how do we get from disruptive innovation to broad adoption? Adoption is driven by significant change to patient and surgeon value by patient and surgeon priority and practiced in their environment. As we consider new technologies and their adoption life cycle, early technologies bring the promise of new advantage but they may be inferior to existing techniques or awkward in others in the very beginning. Early adopters and innovators help work out those kinks and work iteratively to come up with ideas that start to drive real value and change behavior. There's a point at which the broader community recognizes that change and starts to adopt more broadly. And finally, once it's adopted more broadly, the technology and data mature to show the obvious benefit and it feels like something that should have always been there. So where are we along the curve? If you look at where our products and platforms are along the adoption curve, on the left side, you'll see ION, which is our robotic flexible catheter platform, just starting out. Then you see SP, our single port platform, just coming up through the innovators and early adopter stage, which is very exciting. And to the right, our fourth generation multi-port system are past the early majority and moving toward the late majority adoption. What's great about having four generations of surgical, surgical platforms accompanied by a complete ecosystem is that although ION and SP are early in the adoption curve, we don't have to start from the beginning. We're leveraging 25 years of experience, drawing upon the knowledge of millions of procedures to build out our capabilities in our newer platforms. Similar to compound interest, each platform will be harnessing the power of the platforms that came before it. In many cancer cases, a surgeons have a CT scan already available in their PAC system, but there isn't much you can do with it because it's not easy to access it during the case. Wouldn't it be nice to have an anatomically correct segmented image easily available in your console that can be manipulated so that you can refer to it during the case? Here we have a video from Dr. Stifelman, uh, urologist in New York, doing a partial nephrectomy doing just that. He's using IRIS, our 3D segmented imaging technology that brings in a preoperative CT scan and integrates the image into a virtual environment to enable the surgeon to better see and plan. 
For difficult anatomy, it can increase the confidence in structure identification during the case. With post-operative video reports, technology that's currently in pilot mode, you can bring machine learning and AI capabilities together to enhance learning and surgeon performance. Imagine that after a procedure concludes, a performance report is delivered to the surgeon's inbox. Similar to how elite athletes review their video after the game to see where they can improve, surgeons could also view their video and performance data and compare them to and ultimately train to a best practice procedure of their choice. You can see how this information could help decrease surgeon to surgeon variability in outcomes. This is our super program. And while not available widely yet, we're enthusiastic about its prospects. But of course, the training and skill development resources we do offer are plenty. We're always working to develop them further. SimNow, our cloud-enabled simulation platform, seems to be an engaging platform for learning and honing surgical skills. We're not only developing procedure-based simulation, we're also finding that gamification of learning exercises is a great way to get and keep learners' interest and motivate learners to practice even more, helping trainees acquire skills quicker. Telepresence has also been particularly useful during COVID. We've partnered with InTouch to enable remote proctoring and remote case observation. This cloud computing capability is also powerful because these smart, integrated, cloud-connected systems could enable surgeons to collect their own data on surgeon skill acquisition and competence. Here, we can help work with a team to reduce surgical variation that we spoke about earlier. So returning to the question, can we make surgery better? Because of our users who continue to believe in the technology, we are closer to the word yes. And it's gotten us to where we are today. The tools, training, and technologies for mastering surgery are in place. We're still in the early stages, but it's been our privilege to work with clinicians, engineers, and visionaries like many of you to continue to advance the future of care. I'd like to leave you all with a look at a version of that future with this new video by Intuitive. In the 20th century, global life expectancy more than doubled. In the future, Intuitive's focus won't only be on extending how long we live, but also on extending how well we live. Da Vinci is ready. In the meantime, here's Dr. Singh. Good to see you again. If your biopsy is malignant, we'll take you straight to surgery. Lung adenocarcinoma confirmed. Confirming. Jack Sue's nodule is malignant. OR number nine is being prepped. I'd like three additions to my case cart, the fluorescent scope, imaging agents, and the microstapler. Confirmed. Initiate timeout. The patient is Jack Sue, who is having a right upper robotic assisted segmentectomy. Everyone ready? Project thoracic visualization. Singh has completed the segmentectomy on Jack Sue. Thank you, everyone. Great job. with the best 
care possible. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Amara Singh. Thanks to Paul for having me speak. Any questions? The future is intelligent. The future is intuitive. Thank you for joining me today. Enjoy the rest of the conference. So welcome back. Um, that may look like the future, but I can tell you that each one of those different parts currently exist. And that's one of the reasons we built this concept of the Methodist Institute for Robotics, Imaging and Navigation, because it's about taking the preoperative CAT scans and integrating them into the imaging system. And so we're going to have a little discussion here. We're going to be joined by Dr. Kim, who's the head of our thoracic surgery program. And I've already introduced Dr. Von Bolmos, uh, who's here on the podium with me. So we're going to think of some tough uh, questions for these guys. But while we're doing this, there's an appeal. We really want to build the basic science and the engineering around robotics. And from that standpoint, we, we need access to all of those people in the energy business and down at NASA who are working on robotics to try and bring them together and, and help us on this journey. So while we're waiting on Dr. Kim, let me start off with uh, Moritz here. Intuitive started in the cardiac surgery world way back mm -hmm. and then got lost and went into the urology world and now coming back into cardiac surgery. What were, what were the technical problems that, that existed at that time? Yeah, I, I think um, cardiac surgery in many ways is very appealing for um, a robotic approach because it's a technically very challenging procedure. And I think if we think about sort of the basic premise of uh, what technology does, it, it, it replaces or augments technique. And so um, in cardiac surgery, I think it's very appealing as a, it is a complex uh, technical discipline, but um, it is also a discipline that is very high stakes um, where small mistakes can have really grave consequences. And the other thing is we work against the time, typically. And so it, it becomes a very narrow space you have to navigate between um, having a high stakes procedural component and working against time, which is a little bit different from most other disciplines. If you look at um, most other disciplines or thoracic, thoracic surgery, urolo urology, all these other surgical disciplines where the robot has really taken off, um, I, I think it is, it, it can be very complex and it can be very high stakes, but you typically don't work against the clock. The last part is probably that cardiac surgery as a um, discipline is a very small market, uh, and so the market forces certainly play a role in that. Um, while implants are a big market in cardiovascular space, I think the sheer procedural part of it is is quite limited, and so I think that puts uh, specific pressures on the company like yeah. Intuitive to, you know, focus their efforts where they see the uh, biggest ROI. Well, let's see if we doc got Dr. Kim. He was coming in on Zoom. Can you hear me? Oh yeah, we can hear you great, man. And oh, now we can great. see you. So, How are you? I'm great. Yes. So let me give them a little bit of your background. You spend probably 80, 90% of your time working with one of these robots. So you're incredibly experienced from this standpoint. Uh, I know that you work on lungs and esophagus. Can you tell us if, if you had to basically make a list of things that an engineer could help us with, well, what would those things be? Well, what are the limitations at the moment? So, I mean, one of the things that, I mean, I, I personally have done close to about 900 of these uh, robot assisted cases. And um, if I can share like a video of a yeah. case and I can kind of talk to you about what are the limitations that we might have um, as a surgeon uh, by looking at this. Sure, so, go ahead and share your screen. As we heard from one of the previous speakers, this is the most exciting part of a presentation is sharing your screen. <laughs> Okay, so I'm hoping this will work. Um, so here's a video of uh, me performing a right upper lobe lobectomy. Um, and this is the, the, the most advanced platform, DaVinci XI, that our previous speaker was talking about. 
the amazing thing here is that what I can do. So I'm controlling the camera. Um, I'm controlling the arm to assist or retract the lung. So I can do this as a you know, single surgeon operator. And I'm seeing 10 times what I can see. Um, for orientation, this is the right upper lobe of the lung that has cancer in it. So we're doing a right upper lobe lobectomy. This is a blood vessel going into the right upper lobe. And then it's, a, you know, obviously the lung is attached to the heart. Um, we have basically a few millimeters between the, um, the structures where we have to do this kind of complex dissection. And uh, if we're in the wrong place, then we can uh, get into the blood vessel and they can lead to a significant uh, bleeding issues. And you would basically lose your blood volume very, very quickly. So obviously this is a very complex, high stakes operation. Um, the amazing thing here you can see is that you have complete control. Um, technology has gotten better over time. Um, you know, we talked about there's a four iterations of the uh, Da Vinci XI. Man, man, can I you just say what, that, what, what are you doing right now? So I'm doing a stapling and re, uh, dividing that blood vessel. So I was, uh, I just stapled the right upper lobe blood vessel and then it subsequently completed this operation. But so I would say that these are the kind of incremental uh, technologies that allow you to do robotics. Yeah. So let me talk about that. And, yep. you know, we talked about four iterations of the Da Vinci XI. And going back for engineers is that I could not do this operation with uh, number one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. um, it was just, it, we could not do what you just saw. Mm -hmm. So the advancement in their technology is just amazing. The fact that we had that control of a vascular stapler that only came about in 2016. So prior to that, this operation was not possible using the robotics. So, so, so basically, what I, I just want to make sure the audience understands what we're looking at. Basically, what a stapler does is it puts two rows of staples across a blood vessel, makes sure it's completely hemostatic, and then cuts it for you all at the same time. Exactly. Wow. And, um, and that technology and being able to do that and being, have the surgeon control it, uh, and took a lot of engineering hours to make that happen, but ultimately to make it safer. So the operation that you saw on this patient, um, we used to do it with open uh, concept where patient was in the hospital for on average five to seven days uh, with a lot more pain and a lot more complication rate than what you just saw. And this patient went home next day after surgery. And that is what the robotic technology has allowed us to do. And and basically, ultimately, what we are able to do is provide best care for our group of patients. Thank you. So let, me, back, let, me, let me bring Moretz in here and see. because you, I, yeah, no, I, I think those are really important points. And I would say that, you know, the robot has amazing visualization, you know, visualization like you don't get with anything else. And, and so the visualization, again, is stereoscopic it's visualization a, that you have. It's mm -hmm. a 3D vision. Um, and that, you know, is a huge incremental value versus 2D vision with regular scope. So that's fantastic. You have amazing dexterity with the instruments and the wrist of the instruments specifically. So can, yeah. I, can I just make, if you can bring the camera to me for, for a minute. When we, when we started off doing a laparoscopic surgery, imagine uh, this pen was a scope that you put in through into the abdomen. In order to move the tip to the left, the surgeon had to learn to move the hand to the right. So the intuitive part of intuitive surgical was they translated the, the surgeon's normal movements to the end of the robot. And that's one of the huge breakthroughs. I actually, they, the rest was developed by a guy who was an aerospace engineer over at Rice before he went on to Intuitive. Sorry, Moritz. Yeah, so you, you literally have more degrees of freedom than you do with your natural hands because you, you can keep twisting, for example. And so you can do a full 360 degrees, which you couldn't do with your hands. So visualization, dexterity. You, you are the surgeon and can provide exposure. So you're assistant and surgeon all in one. Um, one thing that's missing from, I think, a cardiovascular perspective is suture management, right? And, and so if you think about it, while the robot gives you a lot of uh, capability to do really nice suturing, the suture management is one of the more difficult parts. 
And the reason why thoracic surgery and other surgical disciplines have been very successful, I think, is because of the stapler. Because you don't have to get control proximal and distally yeah. on the vessel and then sew it up. You just fire a stapler across yeah. it. That's true for abdominal stuff. I think it's true for thoracic stuff. And so yeah. that, you know, a way to get um, around the suture management issues in surgery, especially in a discipline like cardiac or vascular where we sew a lot and with long sutures, mm -hmm. that's, I think, yeah. one of the major make your incremental so, value potential. So many says you're doing the easy stuff. That's why you can do it with a robot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, there are other things like uh, when we do esophagectomies where we use a lot of different sutures and, uh, and there are ways to manage, but it's not as high stakes having, you know, blood vessel going through and you have to suture. So I agree that is, there are some challenges moving forward to how to manage that. But in, within our thoracic space, one of the things that we can improve on, I think, is that exactly in terms of understanding anatomy and being able to use CT scans and other um, scans before uh, the preoperative imaging and in, incorporate it into the, uh, the system itself. And I think that imaging is going to play a huge role in the future. And obviously having better instruments, like the stapler right now that what we are using is so much better than what it was before. Uh, mm -hmm. But ultimately, maybe getting a smaller stapler that can provide similar outcomes will be uh, will be will be beneficial. So, I mean, this system that we have is state of the art. But in ten years, or in even five years, I think we're going to be using a different platform, or it's going to get so much better and better. But so, um, it, it's just amazing what we can do now that we were not able to do yeah. before. So, for a long time, uh, one of the criticisms was that you. There were no haptic feedback. You couldn't actually mm. feel the suture or the tissue. Is that really, has that been overhyped? Is that not really relevant? Yeah, so for me, um, when, when you're a novice surgeon, the haptic feedback is very important. But after a while, you get this visual feedback. So you really understand um, what happens in terms of how much pressure you should put on a tissue, uh, what happens with the tissue visually. So. Um, I would say it was might have been very helpful in my first probably you know 30 cases, but after a while, I'm just very used to knowing what's going to happen to that tissue right. based on how I manipulate it. So okay. as a novice, I think it's very important, but uh, but as you get more advanced, it's not that important. So we have an enormous number of robots, and we're just talking about thoracic and cardiac surgery here, but almost every surgical subspecialty. And so what we want to do is figure out the engineering base by which we can do research to help these guys take care of patients better. So you got a bunch of engineers who are watching this. I'm gonna, gonna give you a couple of minutes to think about this. That's, that means 10 seconds, actually. <laughs> if, you were, if you have one request for the people who are listening to this, uh -huh. what do you want help on? So I, for me, it's an easy, a quick answer. There's two devices that have gone away and were previously available for specifically for cardiac. Uh, one is a stabilizer for the heart, which is a very simple thing, actually. To, stop, you mean to hold the heart, to stop it? To ho hold the heart while you do uh, vascular work on the coronaries. Okay. And the second part is uh, something to facilitate creation of anastomosis because, again, you can't hand sew the... And an anastomosis the, is joined is, the blood vessels the joint of two blood vessels. And again, you can do that uh, sewing, but um, there used to be a stapling device which greatly facilitated that portion and led to increased adoption of robotics for coronary artery bypass grafting, but it's no longer available. So. These would be, this would be an equivalent to the stapler in the thoracic and uh, G, you know, GUI space where, where the stapler has become a very important instrument and asset in the procedural uh, process. So in this meeting, we've talked about joining two tubes together several times. Yeah. Now the advantage in oil and gas is they're rigid tubes, non-compliant. We're dealing with non-rigid. We need compliance. Uh, we need to be able to make them watertight. Um, we're not very good at making sure they're watertight. Uh, these guys are forced into pressure testing their, their joints. We just take the clamps off and see if blood sprays all over the place and toss in a few more sutures. So men, what, what do you need in the thoracic world from a, a group of smart engineers? Yeah, for, uh, from my standpoint, I think the biggest thing would be the imaging integration of lung. So lung is very different from other solid organ in that on a CT scan, lung's expanded and then you have a tumor within it. 
but when you operate, you, you, the lung deflates. So the anatomy is gonna be very different. So somehow being able to use that CT scan with lung expanded in an intra-op setting, um, there's a lot of technical engineering challenges where um, you can, uh, so, it, it so let me, really let, hard to do, let me have, point this in the right direction then. Basically what he needs to be able to model is a lung in a patient, fully inflated, and then when he opens the chest, the lung collapse, collapses. Now, we're going to have a CAT scanner in our operating rooms pretty soon, man. We can actually scan the, the collapsed lung, and we can give the modelers the pre and the post and see if they can come up with their logarithm. Because what, he's looking for a little, a little nodule in the middle of that lung, which when the lung is inflated is in this position. When the lung is deflated, mm. oh, we're having a hard time. It's not good. If you, we want to minimize the amount of yeah. lung that we take out, but you've got to get the cancer. And with the robot camera, if you can just, you know, if uh, the robot tells you it, the cancer is right there, that'll be amazing. And I think that would be, you know, what I want to see in the future, what the engineers can work on. So you want something you can put in the cancer that makes it glow when, they put, when you put the camera in there and you can actually see what it is. That's that not, could shouldn't be that really difficult. Cool. Yeah. All right. Any final comments, Maritz? <laughs> No, I think it's a really a incredibly exciting space, and as Min had alluded to, you know, there's a lot of things that we were thinking were not possible five years ago and are done now, and I, I think that space will continue to develop, and, and, and you know, I think there's real uh, potential to grow that market and, and yeah. have some really exciting uh, developments, and uh, I think there's some areas that are a little bit more challenging, again, for market pressures or what have you, but I think uh, there's a great potential benefit to patients um, to have these tools available and continue to develop specific tools for dis specific disciplines, and I, I'm incredibly excited yeah. to be part of this. So, men, five years ago, how much of your practice was robotic? Uh, five years ago, probably maybe uh, about... 2% of my practice was robotics. Right now, it's pretty much 97% of my practice is you know, using the robot. And I have to tell you, I have residents who are coming on service that they tell me that you know, in their practice, they're not gonna be using the laparoscope anymore. Yeah. So in 10, 15 years, I think this is how we're gonna be doing surgery or all the surgery that we do. All right, so Dr. Court here is running this meeting with NASA precision, and I'm now 18 seconds yeah. over schedule. So thank you guys very much indeed. That was very Pleasure. stimulating. Anybody who wants to be in the audience who wants to engage in this, send us something in through the chat room, and we'll link you up to the appropriate people. Okay, Stuart, what's the next exciting thing you've got? Thank you very much. Well, I'm glad I didn't need to use the Santa there. Stuck in <laughs> Santa was getting um, warmed up. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, obviously with robotics as well, a lot goes into training. And we actually do have a little video clip here of a typical training session using the Da Vinci uh, camera. Now, in this video, you'll see a variety of objects that we've used um, to allow this training to happen. So what you're seeing here is, I think, Moritz was... Uh, Doing a training session, felt a little bit hungry as well. <laughs> so we used some Lunchables there, just to get a little bit of training, get a little snack at the same time. So you've got the cheese there and the, the bologna and, and the cracker. And now we have an orange. So again, this is a very good way of practicing skills without needing to use um, cadavers or simulators, etc. And obviously it is Christmas, so we want to practice getting our stockings ready for Santa Claus. Got some little Christmas trees there, some little Santas. And given that it is Christmas, I think we're realizing, oh, we need to uh, write a letter to Santa Claus asking him um, what he can bring us for this year. So yeah, so you know, we do know how to have a little bit of fun when we're training. Um, moving on to the next session, we're entitling this as Mighty Extended Reality. And I will hand it over to Dr. Lumsden to introduce what Mighty is and where we're going with it. Okay, so Mighty, many of you have already seen this kind of hands-on training center. We think it's, well, we know it. Uh, you know, it, Muhammad Ali said, it ain't bragging if it's true. <laughs> it is the best training center in the world. And so, of course, we've been kind of boxed out of hands-on training, so we want to build Mighty and virtual reality. And that's really what we're going to show you, what this concept is all about. Okay, and, and we do have a slide here. So extended reality covers virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. Now, virtual reality has been around, I believe, since 1990s. You may remember the movie Lawnmower Man. Well, we're very happy that it's significantly progressed since then. 
And I believe a couple of months ago, there was a system called the Oculus Quest. That is a standalone virtual reality headset unit that costs $300. This is a game changer. Before you would need a PC, you would need base stations, you would be there for a long time getting it set up, but with the Oculus Quest, you just stick it on and you're in. And we actually do have a video um, of what is VR and how we're using this system. And then that video will be myself demonstrating how you put on a virtual reality headset um, and you go through the introduction. So here's the video. Hello Pumps and Pipes. This is uh, Dr. Stuart Corr here from the DeBakey Heart and Vascular Centre. Um, we are now in the Mighty XR session. I thought what better way to introduce it than to show you what XR is. And one example of XR is virtual reality. This is an Oculus Quest headset. And I'm going to go through a demo and show you how we get started. So let's go. So I'm putting the hat on. Okay, I'm in. Oh wow. Oh my goodness. So I'm in some sort of jungle avatar looking world. Oh, I'm underwater now. Oh, there's a big whale. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, that was a train that just went past. Uh, anything else? <laughs> My air balloon. All right, here we go. Okay, press button, select the gun. It's a taser gun. Okay, you've got a Star Wars theme here. All right. So I'm shooting cubes and triangles. You've got the basics down. Time to explore all that VR has to offer. Have fun. Oh, and that's it. That is an introduction to virtual reality. I hope you've had a good time watching this. I've not made too much of an idiot of myself, but there you go. Goodbye. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm glad you shot that, not me. <laughs> um, let me just say that, so what we're going to do now is show you three different examples of number one, how a company could use VR uh, to showcase their products. Number two is how we can actually use it for device training and have virtual reps train us how to do this. And number three, uh, with, Dr. with Bruce Blousen, we're going to actually show you how we're building the mighty VR kind of showcase. So we'll get to that. So I think first of all, uh, we're gonna. Uh, there are a number of people who are online who represent Storts. I think we're going to show the Storts video first. Yes. Storts is an audiovisual company that we work with fairly closely. Hello, and welcome to the operating room of the future. My name is Christy, and I'll be your host. Come experience a new vision with Carl Storts. Please click on one of the highlighted options to learn more about our technologies sinus surgeons are increasingly turning to image guidance systems. So I'm looking at the NAV1 system. It's something we're very interested in. These systems generate and real time is portable and can be incorporated in a room very good. By superimposing live surgical data on the patient's pre-op radiology scans. Let's start by clicking on the reusable NAV1 headband and tracker to attach them. As with all optical navigation systems, a line of sight is required at all times. However, this technology is not affected by magnetic interference and is completely wireless. Let's use the CMAC video laryngoscope to intubate this patient. CMAC offers a full line of adult, pediatric, and neonatal blade sizes, including standard Macintosh and Miller video laryngoscopes, as well as the D-Blade for adults and pediatrics. The Carl Stortz Blue Light Cystoscopy System offers several advantages over standard white light cystoscopy. It is also the best option for decreased reoccurrence per AUA SUO guidelines. This allows surgeons to see more tumors that could have been easily missed under white light. 
Carl Stort's OR1 4K integrated operating room harnesses the power and flexibility of network switches for hospitals of tomorrow. So I'm basically in this OR1 looking around at the setup in the operating room. Effortless to use. How and easy to very nice up diagram of how these piece. videos are being routed through the cables in the roof. And how you could design an operating room uh, virtually before you actually go ahead and build it. When you, one of the most complex areas to build is actually the overhead uh, because there's so much attached to the roof. So here you can actually see where the, the lights and booms and the monitors are attached. Um, and yeah, again, how these clash with one another is very important and very expensive to fix after the fact. So this is really nice to be able to look at this. Obviously, an additional functionality would be what if we move this over six inches? How do these hinges actually work? Because that's probably the single most complex part of getting these operating rooms right. Okay, so that's an example of how a company who is interested in selling us product can actually demo those products in a very kind of hands-on uh, way. Now we're going to take this to another level. Endologix is a, a medical device company that makes devices to let us fix the aorta. So if we can run the, the video, they're the first ones to create a hands-on training model by which we can, in theory, touch and use these devices. So go ahead, run that video, please. The room, this is essentially what the room set up. That's me, uh, and you'll see through my eyes in a minute. That is a proctor. Now that proctor happens to be, you know, out in uh, Phoenix, Tempe, Arizona somewhere. Uh, so they don't even have to travel in, in order for uh, to actually train us. And as we switch, you're gonna get an over the shoulder look. That's kind of looking over my shoulder at the device. This is a device that is designed to be thread up inside the femoral artery into the aorta to treat an aneurysm. Aneurysm is a big bulge in the aorta. And it makes me use the imaging system, inject dye, get the right uh, views on and the right angle injecting that dye. And shortly you're gonna to switch to looking through uh, my eyes. I'm in there wearing one of these Oculus Quest headsets. And the reason Stuart emphasized this, uh, it, they're now owned by Facebook, that's, that's the user's view, taking the device out. You have to manipulate, position all of these devices. Uh, there are prompts, so it's a unique way of actually training. There are prompts which come up in front of you to say, hey, Dr. Lumsden, you forgot to do this, now you need to go back and do that. And how I can actually insert these devices. This is the devices inside that catheter. That catheter is thread on the guide wire. That controller that uh, Stuart was handling now looks like a hand. And now we're putting that up inside the patient. The x-ray is on, you can see this, and we're going ahead and actually deploy the device. So we see this as having huge applications in medical education. We also see this when we talk about the robotics we've just talked about as being one of the ways that we, we may be able to integrate some of that imaging into the robotic system. And when the reason Stuart emphasized Oculus, we looked at this, we looked at it with Bruce Blousen, who you're going to see and hear from shortly, Oh, four or five years ago and really didn't think it was there. This is a transformation. COVID has increased everybody's interest. And secondly, the Oculus Quest is now down to consumer level pricing. So for example, um, when we run training courses and bring residents and fellows here, we give them an allowance for $400 uh, for, for their flight. We could buy them a controller, leave the, contro the, the, the Oculus Quest with them and probably save money in education and be able to deliver this kind of hands-on product carbon footprint as well and save the carbon footprint all right so we can probably stop it at this point in time and then we're going to roll on to I know Bruce Blousen is um, on the line I can see his dapper physique basically staring at me from the from the camera here and why don't we run the the, the, the Blousen video again the challenge that Bruce and I tried to take on is we can't bring people down to Mighty at the moment what we want to do is be able to take Mighty and our auditorium and the Mathras branding out to them. And so this is kind of what we came up with. And then we'll, we'll hear from Bruce after this. Go ahead. Welcome to what could potentially become the Mighty XR Conference Room. This application brings multiple people from multiple locations together, allowing a collective user experience 
where everyone can access the repository of videos, animations, 3D models, and more from the Methodist and Blossom Medical databases. This will ultimately be an application available from the Oculus Quest Store. We have chosen the Oculus Quest 2 for our application because it is cordless, does not require a PC, and is extremely affordable at approximately $300. In the application, you can have up to 50 participants communicating inside the app. Let's begin the tour. Similar to logging into Zoom or WebEx, Dr. Lumsden logs into the VR room to meet with Mr. Bruce Blossom. Dr. Lumsden's office is located in the Houston Medical Center and Bruce Blossom is located on the west side of Houston. As they stand in their respective offices, the application places them simultaneously inside our VR app room. Let's take a look at the features of this new room. Now, let's teleport to the center of the room. As we look around, we see that there are an initial 15 cardiovascular topics to select on the main screen. These topics are ranged from award-winning animations depicting cardiovascular conditions, treatments, and drugs, as well as surgical video footage of actual patients. Next, let's teleport to the left. Outside the window, you will see the Houston Medical Center and on the right, you can see where the Mighty Center is located. You will feel that you're on the 14th floor of a brand new tower that has been built in the middle of the medical center. Now, let's teleport to the front of the room. Eventually, this room could be attached to other rooms within the Mighty Complex, allowing users access to a variety of medical simulations and other VR applications. In the back of the room, there are approximately 50 seats, each of which will be identified as individual users. Let's select our first topic. We have selected carotid tumor removal. This animation is unique in that it was developed using real patient CT data with a variety of programs, including Materialized Mimics, Autodesk 3DS Max, Adobe Premiere, and Adobe After Effects. The model appears approximately five feet wide and five feet tall. Dr. Lumsden, can pause the video as he and Mr. Blossom explore the 3D model and discuss the tumor. Its location between the bifurcation of the interior and exterior carotid artery, as well as his surgical approach to the dissection of the tumor. Through our relationship with Blossom Medical, the owner of the world's largest 3D medical and scientific library, we plan to populate this application with even more content. All divisions within the Methodist hospital system orthopedics, reproduction, neurology, could be able to access content from the Blossom Medical Library. In addition to the videos, the animations, and the models, we see a future where you can access over 30,000 images from the Blossom Medical Library, as well as CT scans, MRI data, videos, lab results, tests, educational material, and more from an ever-growing repository of content. Ultimately, if a physician is in the room with a patient and wants to educate them on a therapy or drug such as warfarin, they could access that from the Blossom Library and find 3D models, animations, and other materials to enhance the patient education experience. What makes this partnership unique is that both Methodist Hospital System and Blossom Medical are located here in Houston, Texas. We will now turn this over to Dr. Lumsden and Mr. Blossom to answer any of your questions about the app. <laughs> uh, welcome back. I think I got Iron Man up in the top left-hand corner, and I got Aaron. Aaron Cogren is the Director of Medical Education and Communication with Dental Logics, and Daniel Story is an Account Executive with Coral Storch. <laughs> And the unmasked guy is Bruce Blousen. He's the CEO and founder of Blousen Medical. So welcome. Uh, maybe start with you, Aaron. Ladies first. Why on earth did you guys embark upon this idea of building that? Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, it, it really was um, a need that we saw within the organization. I've been with Endologics about two years. 
um, came from a different space within the medical device space. Um, so trained very differently um, in my previous previous job now and, and now being in vascular surgery. We had very limited resources um, with our simulators that we had, um, being able to scale the use of those um, on a global basis. Uh, my team does train globally. Um, so you can imagine shipping things all over the world and trying to connect learners and, and instructors on a global basis becomes very challenging um, using a simulator that you have to ship around. So um, I am not a gamer. I am not uh, a techie person, but um, I had heard about VR and thought if they can simulate all these games in there, why can't we simulate an operating room and procedures? Um, so started working with OSA VR, which is an orthopedic based VR company, um, approached them and said, hey, what would you think about trying um, this in the vascular space? Um, it's been pretty amazing. It allows us to connect users again from all over the world. Um, we can have a key opinion leader physician who's training um, based out of New York to a group in Japan. So it allows us to connect a lot of users together. Um, it also allows us to practice on a more frequent basis. I think that's one of the challenges in learning for our physicians and for our internal uh, representatives is they just don't have the frequency and opportunity to practice over and over again. Mm -hmm. So in the virtual environment, the sky is the limit. They can practice um, multiple, multiple um, attempts. Physicians can take the unit, can put the headset on prior to a case. Perhaps they haven't practiced in a while or had a case in a while. It allows them to really go through the procedure prior to the case. So. Um, it's That's been great. a really exciting experience um, bringing yeah. it to Endologics. It's Thank been great you. supporting that. And the hope is at some point in time it can be patient specific. It's your aneurysm mm -hmm. that we do we Absolutely. blend these things. Bruce talked about patient specific animation. The same technology could be used to import, extract, and import, export that data uh, so we can actually practice on it. So maybe I'll come to Bruce next. And so Bruce, give, it, give us the big vision for this. Why on earth do you even want to bother with this kind of stuff? Well, for me, we've got this huge library of content. I mean, we've been in business for almost 30 years. And over that time, we've built and developed tens of thousands of 3D models. And being able to take these models and import them into a 3D environment like VR is the first time where you really have an opportunity to, to immerse yourself and put your head inside anatomy that was never possible before. And also, you're not limited to scale. So for example, if you want to be standing inside an artery, that's possible now. If you want to stand on uh, a myosin molecule and watch actin next to you being contracted, that's possible. And we see this not just for patient education and student education, but also for continuing education. And I think that you know, from the standpoint of medical device companies, I think it's imperative that they do this. Um, I, mean, I think it's super cool technology. Uh, earlier they were talking about their haptic senses and that always was a concern for me. And then to hear men say that, you know, the haptic part of it isn't really as important as it used to be, uh, that it's not even a concern after like say 30 surgeries, uh, that really kind of opened up another idea. So I, mean, I, I love what everyone is doing. I think that everyone is taking the right approach. I think that this technology with the Oculus Quest 2 to only being $300 is super affordable. And I think that you're going to see the cost of virtual reality uh, continually drop. It's like websites. I mean, there used to be a time where in say 2000, if you wanted a website, you were a large organization that might run you $250,000, $350,000. Now you can get a website for free. I mean, literally go and produce your own website. And so I see this as one of those situations where the costs right now, are extremely high. I think that the technology, the HTC Vive, that's set up at $5,000 or $3,000. Uh, the Oculus Rift and some of the costs associated with that. I mean, everybody's kind of like just recognized that, you know, the Quest 2 at $300 may not be the glamor piece, but it really is the piece that allows multiple users. And I think that when you have a lot of people at home and a lot of people that can't travel, and for $300 to put on a headset and to be in an OR or to be in an educational center and to gain access to this material, I think that's absolutely the way of the future. Thank you, Bruce. So let me, let me get Daniel in last. We've got a couple of minutes left before the dancing Santa is gonna kick us out of here. Um, why, why don't you activate them so we know exactly what it looks like. So this is important. 
One minute left. One, so one minute, minute left. left. Daniel. You got two minutes left, actually. Go ahead, Daniel. Why do Storch do this? And where do you see it going? Uh, I think, um, as you were saying earlier on, that um, as a marketing tool, um, it, it is fantastic to be able to get people and give them a real idea of what it's like in the OR and, and look at different products in our portfolio. Um, I think from a training perspective as well, um, it's, it's important, particularly with people unable to travel. So... Um, able to uh, to help with the with the training, um, you know, depending on uh, which product they're uh, they're looking at, and I think also moving forward, it's it's definitely part of the future, and uh, we look at ways in which we can improve uh, things like patient turnover using augmented reality, um, and also overlays uh, during cases. We're working uh, on a roadmap on that in order to. Um, to bring new sensors to, to operating um, in order to, to make sure that um, um, for the best sort of patient um, outcomes. So I think there's a lot going on in the space and, and we're just starting out um, as more marketing, but moving forward, um, you know, hoping to have more practical applications in the OR. All right, thank you. So what we tried to do is bring together three different experiences. One, how, does, how can it benefit your company? Number two, how can it benefit hands-on physician uh, training? And number three, how can we broaden it out to give you the auditorium type experience? I think you all uh, demonstrated that beautifully. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you.